today. Right, so the next session is by Professor Jane Monkton-Smith. Um, Jane is a professor of public protection at the University of Gloucestershire. She is a former police officer and her passion for working in DA was awakened by the, by the theory she felt that people are not more outraged about women being murdered by current or former partners when she was still in the police. She became an academic and is now a leading expert on domestic homicide, carrying out domestic homicide reviews for the Home Office and working with relevant charities. Jane is about to show us the stages that lead up to murder in a coercive controlling relationship. Pay attention because you'll probably recognize some of those stages, even you, you know, even though you may think you're in a normal relationship or you have been normal relationships, um, either from your personal life or from your professional experience. I'm going to, share, to play Jane's sessions for you now. I'm Professor Jane Monkton-Smith and I specialise in a homicide, coercive control and stalking. This narrative where um, it's, it's explained that the homicide happens as a result of spontaneous anger or red mist coming down or somebody just losing control and, and almost accidentally killing their partner. This needs serious challenge because that narrative tells us that these homicides are not predictable. And if they're not predictable, that, that, that's saying that really we can't do anything to stop them. Well, this research really challenges that belief. And we were able to identify eight clear stages that seem to happen in gosh, the majority of our cases um, before the homicide happened. So the first stage, stage one, is that the perpetrator of the homicide will have a history of certain behaviours. They're almost a type that we can say, yep, yeah, that, that type of person, that controlling, possessive, jealous type of person is more likely to... Um, indulgent in a homicide but it also says a lot of a lot of other things that the the, the relationship with them is going to be very difficult um, we didn't always find that however that that history was in their criminal record we found mostly actually that they would either reveal that history themselves when they're talking to their partner or that history would be revealed through their former partners. So it was very common uh, in this research to find that they had said things like, oh, I, you know, I've got this crazy ex-girlfriend, she used to push my buttons, she told lots of lies about me. That kind of disclosure is actually really, really important and should be considered a history. The second stage um, is, is when two people meet. So we found that the, the common characteristics here were that the relationship very often started very quickly but you know would be explained away as you know we're, we're really in love, we're really passionate about each other. They had said that you know the, the person is very intense, they want the relationship to move on very quickly. The, the more important I thing, I think, in stage two is n not just the speed with which the relationship starts, you know, moving in together quickly, maybe a, an early pregnancy, early declarations of love, was what the controlling person was actually looking for in stage two. And we found that what they're actually looking for is a commitment. And in their heads, once a commitment is given, it cannot be withdrawn. It's almost as if you, um, as a victim, become a possession and they have rights or, or entitlements to you or, or the relationship. Uh, the third stage is when a relationship is formed. So the two people are now in a relationship and in every case that relationship was dominated by controlling patterns control is the is the big high risk marker does that person um, try to control where you go who your friends are maybe what you 
what you wear, whether you go to work or not. Um, there's, there's lots of ways that, that people can be controlled, but without exception, I would say, um, this stage, stage three, is dominated by control, possessiveness and jealousy. The fourth stage is what we call the trigger stage. Now, the trigger is an event or something that happens that challenges the control that the controlling person has over their victim, their children, the family, uh, the relationship, basically. The single biggest trigger for high risk of homicide is a separation, a threat of a separation or, or even an imagined separation. So the control is act, actually being taken away. So that leads us to stage five, which is the response to that trigger, the response to that challenge. So stage five is what we call the escalation stage. So this will be where the controlling person attempts to regain control. So they may become more possessive, They're, they may, may become more violent, they may become violent at this point because they're trying to get back the control. They may try begging, they may try crying, they may try love bombing, anything to get that control back, to get that victim back in their life. Now, it may be also that um, the relationship ends. Now, if the relationship does end and the attempts to regain that relationship have not worked, this is when intimate partner stalking starts. And that's why intimate partner stalking is so dangerous. It's already at stage five in this timeline. And it may be that this is a kind of punishment for the person leaving them, but they become kind of fixated or obsessed on that person and just won't let them leave. So what we find in stage five, and it's really important, a number of things can happen. So it may be that the attempts to regain the control actually work and the relationship is reinstated. Um, that means everything just circles back to stage three. So you just go back to the relationship that's dominated by control. It may be that at some point the person accepts that the relationship is over and they, they circle back to stage one where they are a person with a history of control who's looking for their next relationship. If everything does, you know, goes back to stage three, um, what we find is is a constant circling. So you've got the relationship, and then there's a trigger, and then there's an escalation, and it goes back to the relationship again. So we get three, four, five, three, four, five, over and over and over again. And many um, professionals will recognise this this circling, because that you know you you will be constantly called maybe or asked for assistance in relationships where um, these triggers and escalations are, are happening over and over again. The most concerning thing to happen at stage five is that they don't circle and they progress and they progress forward to stage six. Uh, stage six uh, I have called um, a change in thinking it's a stage where they have moved on from trying to get the relationship back. They have accepted that it's irretrievable, but they're not going to go back to stage one. They are going to pursue this. And, and um, it has been said uh, in, in research done by professors Russell and Rebecca Dobash, for example, that it, they say that the mindset changes from keeping the person in the relationship to punishing them for leaving it. And this last chance thinking could almost also be described as, as a kind of decision making stage. And when this timeline progresses, this is the stage at which they will decide that homicide is the way 
that they are going to resolve things. Um, it's a very difficult stage to identify because the behaviours are uh, can be quite strange. There could be um, a sudden calmness where they made the decision so they're not so uptight about it anymore they know how they're going to resolve it so they become more calm for others they may well continue with the escalation continue with the stalking their threats um, may be to kill themselves um, and at stage five uh, a threat to suicide should always be uh, considered as as a threat to homicide because a threat to suicide at this stage is is not usually a solitary act they may well be considering con killing themselves but they will also be considering killing their partner or children or others um, but once they're in that stage the next logical stage is stage seven which is the planning stage and you know in if you're going to think about the crime of passion narrative then that wouldn't have a planning stage you know something that's spontaneous doesn't have a planning stage but we have looked at hundreds and hundreds of these cases and they nearly all contain some kind of planning and during this stage they may well be looking at things um, lots of google searches we found you know, how to kill somebody, how to bury a body, how much of this drug will kill somebody. The, the stage eight is the homicide. I think it's really important to say that these things are not inevitable. They can be stopped at any stage in this timeline. I have seen homicides stopped at stage eight at the stage where there is an actual attempt. They can be stopped at stage one. So the really, really positive messages are that when you look at each stage, you as a professional may be able to see where you could intervene, depending what stage you're in, to try and stop this progressing any further. It's not inevitable. And of course, not every case in fact most cases will not get to stage eight but we really do need to be um, looking out um, for those cases that may end at stage eight and especially in the covid restrictions we have seen a huge rise in control and domestic abuse and unfortunately we've seen a huge rise in homicides as well Okay, thank you very much, um, Professor Jane Moncton-Smith. So if you've got any questions about that session, please um, put it in there. Um, I found that really interesting because Jane has gone through over 400 homicide reviews and she has extracted this pattern of this eight-stage process for us. And, you know, did you, did you recognize any of that in your own personal life? Um, so especially the first one, the history, you know, the crazy ex-girlfriend, um, I have heard that, um, and that should potentially raise a f raise a red flag because you know people are with each other for a while and then they break up, and you know why does that person uh, apparently suddenly become a bad person? They don't necessarily become a bad person, you know. You maybe you just broke up. So if somebody, I know many people have a lot of negative things to say about their ex partners, and some of them are legitimate. But you know, if somebody is you know saying what Jane was saying, he really pushed my buttons, was telling lies about me. You know, and, and pushing the buttons, maybe that this person was simply trying to go out with her friends and he was against it. And she was then trying to go out with her friends again. And he was, oh, she's really pushing my buttons. I've already told her she's not supposed to do that. So, you know, just, just bear that in mind. So I've, I've made notes of these eight stages um, for you. One is the history, the crazy ex-girlfriend. Two is the quick progression into into a new relationship. So the offender wants commitment. He wants to trap. He wants to wrap that control around the victim. They want to move in together. He wants to maybe get pregnant very quickly, wants to get married very quickly, wants some kind of commitment. Um, a controlling relationship, you know, often that involves separating the victim from friends and family. 
you know, in extreme cases, controlling what they eat, what they what they wear, whom they see, and wanting to be with them all the time, not because they're sweet and romantic, but because they want to control the exposure that this person gets to the outside world. Stage four is that this control is challenged in some way. Maybe the person, the victim, does try and go and see out friends, go out to see friends, or just try and get a job, or wear something different, or they try to break up. So the most um, the usually that control is challenged by attempted separation or separation. The offender often can't handle that. Stage five is the escalation of pressure to try and get the person back. So either putting more pressure, more intimidation, more man manipulation, more control. Manipulation can look as it look like crying and begging. It's not necessarily violent. Making the person feel guilty, threatening suicide. And Jane said at this stage, the person threatens suicide. That is actually very dangerous for other people as well not just the offender and actually um, an attempt uh, a threat threat of suicide is actually a good predictor of domestic homicide as well one of the few predictors that we have now at this stage if the victim does get pressurized or manipulated into staying with the person the relationship circles back to stage three so one to eight stage five separation pressure is then put on the victim and if they do agree to get back together they circle back to stage three which was the controlling relationship what they can also do is if the offender does accept the breakup they circle back to stage one and now you're the ex the crazy ex-girlfriend or one of the crazy ex-girlfriends you know to add to the um to the library of crazy ex-girlfriends or what gets really dangerous is the if that if it then progresses to stage six, seven, and eight. Stage six is um, the offender realizes the relationship is irretrievable, wants to punish the partner, maybe start stalking them. Seven is planning the murder, and eight is the actual murder. The uplifting bit here, think, uh, here I think, is that what um, Professor Moncton Smith actually emphasized at the end. This is predictable. We have this outline now. We understand this pattern now. It can be prevented and intervened at any stage. Okay, so if you see, if you recognize any of this going on, you know, be very aware, speak to the person involved, see what kind of support is out there. Okay, it can be prevented. Jane wrote a book about this, okay, recently released, In Control, Dangerous Relationships and How They End in Murder. If you want that book, um, you'll find the link in the comments. Please post that, um, paste that link into your document of um, useful links that maybe you're keeping whilst you're watching this, and uh, I'm sure you will really enjoy it.